What is going on guys, welcome back to C++ tutorial series. In today's video, we're going to talk about preprocessor directives. So let us get right into it. All right, so what are preprocessor directives? Preprocessor directives are statements that are executed by the preprocessor, which means that they happen before the compilation. These are not statements that are going to be executed during runtime or during uh, compilation, but before the actual compilation. So what does that mean? If we have something like return zero, or if we have something like int a equals 10, those are statements that belong to the program. And they're going to be executed when we reach that certain point, they're going to be compiled to assembly to bytecode. Uh, and then we're going to execute them when we get there. Preprocessor directives are not going to be part of the code in and of themselves they are going to do something with the code. So there are statements that manipulate the code before we actually get into compiling the code. And we already have one of those preprocessor directives in here. And this is the include IO stream statement. Preprocessor statements are always uh, initialized with a hashtag symbol. And we have stuff like include, we have stuff like define, we have stuff like undefined or pragma or uh, if defined, if not defined and so on. And today we're going to get a little bit of an overview over those different statements. But first of all, let's cover what include actually does. What include actually does is and this is why it's a preprocessor directive. It just copies the code that is written in IO stream and puts it in here. So everything that's written in IO stream, we just get it and put it into this file. This is what it does. It doesn't do anything fancy like uh, linking stuff and so on. It just says, okay, take the code of IO stream and put it in here in place of this include statement. And because of that, we have all the functionality of the IO stream library. Now we're going to take a look first of all at the define statement, because that's a quite simple statement. And the define statement is just uh, defining macros. So we can say, for example, I don't know, uh, a macro could be just a constant, we can also say a macro is pi define pi. And then in those parentheses, we can say, okay, we want to define pi as 3.14159 and so on. This is just pi. And now what happens is that every time we see the keyword pi somewhere, um, we're going to replace it. So if I say std c out pi std end line, this is not the same as saying I have a variable pi or something because if I would have a variable pi, what would happen is it would have to look where is this variable, it would have to load the value from there and so on. What we do here is we just replace the text pi with this number. This is done before the compilation. This is not something that the program does. We don't look for pi. We don't find its location. We don't load the floating point number. We just replace the string pi with the value 3.14159 and so on. This is all it does. This happens before the compilation. And if we run this, we're going to see that we get uh, the number as a result here. So this is a macro, we can also do this with strings. For example, we can say define, um, I don't know, for example, if we're using shared, uh, shared memory, we can say shm name, and we can say my shared mem or something like that. This is just a string. And whenever you write shm name, you will get that as a string. Now, why is this useful? Because it's best practice, or it's recommended to um, define macros for stuff that can change easily. For example, let's say you're defining or you're working with some sort of buffer or some sort of array that has to have a max size. Uh, and you have to work with that size on multiple different locations. And instead of doing something like int array, and I have 128 slots here. And then again, I have to have a full loop that goes up until 128 slots and so on. Instead of doing that, I can define a macro in which I say, array size or max size or something like that. And I can say 128. And every time I want to refer to that size, I just say something like, okay, initialize this integer array with array size slots. This is how you do it. And you can also say uh, for int i equals zero, i less than array size and so on. Uh, you can do it like that. This is what we use macros for. Now we can not only define strings and numbers with macros, we can also define functions, we can say something like define square and pass a parameter a for example, and then we would just say, okay, this means a times a. 
Now this is dangerous though. I mean, let's first of all see that it works. Square five. And you're going to see that the result is going to be 25. But it's dangerous because what we're doing here is we're just taking this string and we're replacing it. Uh, we're replacing it with uh, a times a. This is not the same as saying uh, int square int a and then return a times a. And I'm going to show you why this is not the case. This is not the same thing because it actually replaces this string here with this times this. And this is problematic because if I have a variable, let's say int, uh, int i equals, I don't know, let's say five. And now I want to say, okay, I want to square five, but I want to square um, five plus plus, which means that I want to square five, I want to get 25 as a result, but then increase i by one. This is what we would expect to happen here. We pass i uh, we process i and then we increase i by one. So we would want to get 25 and then i should be six. But of course, if we run this, we're not going to get i equals six, we're going to get i equals seven. And this is because this uh, statement here, i plus plus is just copied. So instead of having um, i passed and i times i, we're getting i plus plus times i plus plus, and we're not even getting 25 because we're getting six times five and then we increase it to seven. So this is problematic and you need to take care of that. So I would not recommend defining functions uh, like that. So this is not uh, recommended for functions. You can also uh, try to work around with, with some parentheses and so on, but it's, not, it's, it's just not something that I would recommend. Don't do it like that unless you have a good reason to do it like that. So now let's take a look at uh, another keyword, which is undefined. It's a very simple one or actually undef. It just means that what we defined, we now undefined. And if I do it like that, we're not going to be able to print pi here. So you're going to see that we get an error. Pi was not declared in the scope. So the preprocessor is not able to uh, replace it with anything. It's just not declared because we cannot find a macro. We cannot find a variable called like that. We cannot find a constant. Um, whereas if I don't do that, we're going to print pi. And also, if I do it after that, we're going to be able to uh, print pi, but we're not going to be able to print it after that undefined statement. And this can be useful if you're defining mathematical constants that have uh, names like e, for example. So let's say we have e, and I'm not sure what e is, I think 2.7 or 17, I don't know, 2.7, let's say. Um, and if we have a constant like e defined, the problem is that e is a name that is easy to, uh, you know, it's easy to find something else called e. And if you don't want every e in your code to be replaced by, uh, by 2.7 or something like that, you would have to define it, use it and then undefine it as soon as possible. So for the rest of the code, uh, there is no constant, no macro with the name e. This is just a simple example of uh, undefined. Now we can also have conditions based on those macros. So let's say I have some macro, um, I don't know, trigger or something like that. And then I say, if this macro is defined, so if def trigger, then do something like trigger is defined and end if like that. And if I run this now, trigger is defined. And if I undefine this, so if I say undef trigger, <clears throat> it's not going to get into that block. And of course, if I don't define it at all, it's also not to get into that block. But we're also not getting any miss uh, any errors here, because we're just checking is this uh, macro defined or not. And if it's defined, get into this code here. Uh, otherwise, don't get into it. And we can also do the other way around. We can also say if not defined, so if n def, if not defined, then trigger or then uh, execute this code. And if I now go ahead and define trigger, <clears throat> we're not going to execute that code. As you can see, and this can also be used to uh, check on which operating system you are. So if you're on Linux, for example, you can do something like if def uh, Linux, and then you're going to execute a certain piece of code. Um, so for example, you can say this is Linux code and so on. 
and you can do the same thing for windows if def win 64 you're operating on win 64 and so on so you can uh, do a bunch of different macros i would just google depending on what you want to do you can you can look for operating system macros c plus plus or uh you know drivers or anything that could be interesting you can just check if it's defined and if it's defined you can uh do a certain uh execute certain pieces of code only if you're operating on a certain system for example now, then there's also a keyword or a preprocessor directive that triggers errors. And this is very interesting because uh, let's say I have condition one and I have condition two and both are defined. And let's say those conditions are contradicting. This could be something like, are you operating on Linux or on Windows? And if both of them are set, something has gone wrong. So we can say if def, if def condition one, and if also def condition two, we're going to enter that block here. So do end if, and end if, uh, and what we can do to trigger an error so that we cannot compile is we can just say error like that. And if we're going to run this here, we get error because we get an error, obviously. I can also just write error like that to make sure I cannot compile. And then you're going to see that we are not allowed to compile because this just triggers an error, obviously. Uh, and last but not least, I want to talk about the last preprocessor directive that we're going to talk about today. It's called pragma once. And this is uh, one of those directives that is not part of the C++ standard, but you can still use it because almost every compiler supports it. And this essentially means pragma once means that if you have, for example, two header files that include, uh, include each other, and this is not something that you would do in the main CPP file, but let's say you have header file one includes header file two and header file two includes header file one. Uh, what would happen then is since you're always just replacing this with the code of the other one, you would get an endless recursion of I include you, you include me, I include you and so on. And if you want to say this thing is only going to be included once and after that, it's not going to be included anymore, you can say pragma one. So that's the purpose of this uh, preprocessor directive. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.